Good afternoon. All are welcome today to the Minnesota Inclusive Higher Education Consortium Learning Community Event, Access to College, Ableism versus Inclusion and Opportunity. My name is Sally Sexton, and I'm here with Rebecca Dosh Brown. Today is the second of three learning community events that MyHEC is offering each month through May. Our learning objectives today are, participants will know how disability history influences educator attitudes, school systems, and educational experiences of people with disabilities. Participants will understand how ableism impacts students with intellectual and developmental disabilities, accessing, participating, and finding a post-secondary path as an individual based on interests and strengths. And third, participants will reflect on how inclusion and opportunity leads to growth and development as an adult. We'd like to start by asking the question, why are students the best teachers? Here are some possible answers. Students reflect possibilities others can't imagine. In fact, you never really know what people can do. Students teach us humility because only they can teach us who they are, what they need, and how best to support them. Students defy labels and expectations. Students are always changing, growing, developing, and learning. The body and mind are not fixed in time, just like our bodies are never not changing, so too with our minds. Students constantly surprise us. We will always be challenged by students because students show us different ways of learning. Adults and educators will adapt and flex to these different ways students learn and stay open to learning from our students as teachers. In addition, people learn best when they feel valued, when educators and peers hold high expectations for them and when they are taught and supported as they want and need per their body and mind. We will start with this foundational understanding that students are our best teachers and that all people can learn. So when did we start valuing some learners more than others? When did we start providing opportunities for some and not others? When did we start including some students and not others? Our next step in this journey is to go back in history and look at how value was and is constructed by society, differing across cultures and eventually leading to constructing who is said to be valuable and who isn't. We will explore the historical roots of how intelligence got defined and by whom, through intelligence testing, we will see how this definition of intelligence shapes how education looks today and led to segregation and social isolation and the othering of people by labeling, which unfortunately can predetermine future outcomes. Just a note that some of this history may be triggering as it describes harms and oppression of people with disabilities and others. Rebecca is now gonna take us on this journey. Hi, this is Rebecca again. So how did political reformers and politicians decide which students could access education, what kind of education, and for how long? Class, gender, ability, race, and family background played roles in how they decided who was worthy or suitable for education. Not surprisingly, the first schools of the 1600s and 1700s were almost exclusively for the white sons of land-owning white males. As public education gradually expanded in the 1800s, school leaders tried to limit opening schools fully, mainly because states and townships didn't want to pay. One tool to exclude was the use of the intelligence test first designed in the 1890s by a French psychologist, Alfred Binet. This slide shows Binet as an older white French man, mostly bald, 
with a long bushy beard and wearing thin wired glasses. Binet was asked by the French government to create a way to identify students in need of extra support to learn. The test he made was never meant to mark any students as gifted or smart or to label students as not smart or uneducable. Importantly, Binet emphasized that intelligence was not a fixed, innate genetic quality, but rather a complex quality influenced by environmental and social factors. He believed intelligence varied and changed across one's life. Binet had three rules for use of his test. One, scores do not define anything permanent. Two, the scale is a rough guide for identifying and helping children and is not a way of measuring children's worth. And three, low scores do not mean a child can't learn. In the US, however, the use of intelligence testing did not follow Binet's rules at all. In fact, intelligence tests were and still are used very differently here than Binet ever intended. One reason why was the influence of an American psychologist, Henry H. Goddard, and his colleagues. Goddard translated Binet's scale in 1908. Goddard, shown here as a white man in a tuxedo with a bald head, mustache, and wire rim glasses, strongly encouraged Binet's test to be used in public schools. But he also argued that low test scores were caused by heredity and predetermined people's lives. He argued for one, laws that would prevent breeding of feeble-minded and other minoritized people, compulsory, compulsory sterilizations, and more state institutions to segregate people with low IQ scores from others. Goddard was a proponent of eugenics, and eugenics is a pseudoscience that places humans on a strict scale of value and worth. And eugenicists took Binet's test to legitimize the field of psychology and medicine because doctors and psychologists were paid to run these large expanding state institutions. So by later 1880s, the desire was strong then to widen who could be labeled deviant or as a problem to be fixed. The labels from the tests allowed many people to be sent to state institutions, asylums, prisons, or work farms. Now, who exactly were sent to these institutions? Well, a lot of people. There were children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, people with physical and sensory disabilities and mental health conditions. They were children living in poverty or without parents or children convicted of petty crime. They were indigenous children sent to state boarding schools. They were formerly enslaved African men and women mainly sent to work farms and prisons. They were women who had children or sex outside of marriage, and they were people convicted rightly or wrongly of crimes. So eugenics policies thus justified institutionalization, sterilization, lobotomies, and imprisonment of people perceived as threats. Eugenic beliefs still shape today's assumptions about made about people with disabilities and about all people devalued by the eugenic dominant value system that is ultimately based on white supremacy. Some of you know that people institutionalized as children are still alive today. They tell stories of abuse and of being denied their freedom, and they were given little or no access to meaningful education. Intelligence testing in schools also rationalized predicted labor roles or determined who could do what jobs. Industrialization and state institutionalization rose up at the same time. And in the factory setting, huge numbers of bodies and minds now needed to be predictable and easy, easily exchangeable. So any person not considered a standard worker were not desired. Okay, that was a lot, but let's pause here and think about histories and intelligence testing impact on today. The question, which I believe Liz will put in chat, that we want you to reflect on is, 
disability is often excluded completely or mentioned as part of a long list and not discussed when people talk about equity and social justice and education. Why do you think this omission or erasure happens? We'll have about two to three minutes for you to type your thoughts and responses and please read each other's. Um, and later we'll, we'll uh, synthesize them. I'll read out loud um, some that are coming up. One, it's thought of as a medical problem instead of a political and minority identity. That history has not captured or included in the narrative, this history. Culturally, we still view disability through the medical model instead of the social identity or identity model. I, someone says it's because the area of disability is so large and nebulous. Yep. And someone else said very uh, aptly that it's just simply a lack of education. We were not taught about it mm -hmm. in this way. Mm -hmm. And I also see um, that disability is made invisible um, and not discussed. And we can see that with a lot of the social isolation and segregation that still continues today. Mm -hmm. Yes, and disability was equated as a personal failing, um, not as a societal ill or a societal construction, I should say. <laughs> All right. And the other one I was, I was going to read was that it's an afterthought um, and that disability work was done only in, in the name of compliance and not to honor an identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Yeah, I'm happy to see these thoughtful comments you shared. Um, there's so many coming in, <laughs> so mm -hmm. feel free to look at them. But let's move on now um, to the next slide for a definition um, of ableism by the disability activist, uh, Lydia X. Z. Brown. Ableism, according to Lydia, is oppression, prejudice, stereotyping, or discrimination against disabled people on the basis of actual or perceived disability to a way of thinking and doing that systematically acts as if some people's abilities, bodies and minds are less valuable, less worthy and less desirable than others. Ableism is deeply woven into all of our systems and institutions. And like all isms, ableism causes ongoing prejudice, segregation, discrimination, systemic bias, societal oppression, emotional and physical harm, as well as high rates of violence and trauma at the same time. It is also privileging others with more access, more opportunities, and more perceived value and worth. Now I'm going to pass it to Sally, who is going to read you a list of examples of ableism. This is Sally. Do I ever have a list of examples of ableism? I'll first give credit because a few examples were adapted from a poem by poet, author, and disability rights activist, Maria Palacios, seen here. The image is of a woman smiling with long brown hair and eyes closed, sitting in a wheelchair with arms out wide, palms turned toward the camera. She's wearing a brown top with black pants in front of a red background. We linked her poem at the end of the slideshow. 
For, day, for today, we added examples we felt were missing in the poem, such as examples of ableism faced by people who have less visible disabilities, such as mental health disabilities, intellectual disabilities, or neurodevelopmental disabilities like autism or ADHD. We added them since society too often equates disability discrimination and disability itself only with physical disabilities. As you listen, listen as you might to song lyrics, except this is not a beautiful song at all, and it's about ableism. Notice if any examples feel less obvious to you than others. Some are so deeply embedded in how society operates that most of us don't question them. And finally, when I say the word you, I don't mean you as an individual per se, but I mean you, I mean society in general. And when I say I, that's not me, but we mean disabled people in general. Okay, it's a long list of ableist examples that'll take about five minutes. You say I do not seem disabled, and you mean that as a compliment. You use a baby voice when you speak to me. You think it's better, safer, more desirable for me to be with other people like me as if my interests follow my disability. You set low or zero expectations for me. You don't give me homework. You ask questions about me to my adult caregivers instead of talking directly to me. You react to my accommodation request as if it's a burden for you and not my legal right. You embrace adapting course materials for high achievers, but don't consider how this could be done for lower learners. You tell your children to stop staring at me and you pull them away from me. You use words in everyday conversations like crazy, idiot, and stupid. You think I'm not worth befriending or dating. You compare me to other people with my disability and tell me I am higher or lower functioning. You predict out loud from a very early age how I will get further and further apart from my peers in academics as I get older. You see me as a problem or as a distraction or too much work for you and other students. You let me win every game and contest and everyone cheers and gives me all A's instead of helping me try to do my best. You reward people with a full scholarship even if they might mistreat and bully other people daily. You assume because of my skin color or my accent that I can't be as smart as you are. You legally pay me 50 cents an hour to work a job where everyone else gets minimum wage. In fact, you get tax relief for hiring and paying me sub minimum wages. You feel sorry for me. You compare how much worse I am doing than someone else with my same disability. You question why I would need to take a science or math class. You're always trying to heal me, fix me, or improve me, even though I tell you I like who I am. Let's pause again and take a deep breath. Thinking about what you just heard in this poem about ableism, how did it make you feel? Did it, did you think of any other examples? please feel free to type your thoughts and feelings and other examples in chat. Liz, could you please put those two questions in the chat? Oh, you did, thank you.
Christ. Yeah, Karen, Karen shares how she feels guilty of doing some of these things, even though she has a child with disability. I feel the same way. None of us are immune from ableism. We've been taught it. So the purpose today is to see it, acknowledge it, and, you know, start working on it, doing better every time we can. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Michael makes a good point about ableism uh, by denying people communication devices and support if they're nonverbal um, and how much verbal communication is prioritized and valued. That's so true, Michael. And also the written word, right? It's so privileged mm -hmm. um, over oral um, speaking or just speaking. Or not? Yeah, <laughs> I. You know what I mean. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> you confirm me. <laughs> yeah, I see everybody being very reflective, and that's um, exactly what I did the first time I heard this poem. It. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And Oana points out how structurally and systematically this is organized. Um, and it creates these microaggressions because microaggressions reflect societal values, right? Mm -hmm. So we're just mimicking what we're taught mm -hmm. without thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we'll move on just because we have a short window of time, but please mm -hmm. uh, thank you for for sharing um can we go to the next slide um i should have said rebecca speaking here sorry <laughs> um this slide shows a graph that explicitly shows how ableism and racism share the roots of the same tree which is a quote from the disability activist rebecca coakley we got it from um a podcast the first episode um, that Rebecca did with historian Ibram X. Kendi. Um, his podcast is called Be Anti-Racist, and we listed it in the resources. Please listen to it. It's his first podcast of the series, and it's really informative. Um, anyway, so this graph shows that a bar chart of poverty rates of working age population ages 18 to 64 by race, ethnicity, and disability status, and it's from the 2018 U.S. Census. So I don't know how well you can see, so I'm going to describe it. So the red bars represent poverty rates of non-disabled people, and the blue bars represent poverty rates for disabled people. So you can see on the far right, that's the total poverty rate for all disabled Americans living in poverty, and they live at poverty at more than twice the rate of non-disabled Americans. Now, um, from the left of the graph to the right, disabled non-Hispanic white Americans have a poverty rate almost three times higher than non-disabled white Americans. And then disabled non-Hispanic black Americans have a poverty rate 4.5 times higher than non-disabled white Americans. Disabled Latinx Americans have a poverty rate of 3.5 times higher than non-disabled white Americans. And disabled indigenous Americans have also a poverty rate of 3.5 times higher than non-disabled white Americans. So clearly this illustrates that the highest rates of poverty occur at the intersection of non-white races and disability status. This is exactly what Kimberly Crenshaw meant by intersectionality. It is when one's multiple minoritized or oppressed identities are compounded and the societal harm increases that one experiences. Or as Daphne Frias says, disability activist, Disabled people live at the intersection of all systems of oppression and social justice issues. Sally, can you do the next slide? Yes, this is Sally. Since 1990, 
Under the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, disabled people in the US have legal rights to reasonable accommodations and adaptions. So addressing barriers is not just a nice thing to do, it's the law. Barriers to access can be physical, sensory, attitudinal, or systemic. Here are some examples. Physical, like the lack of an elevator. Sensory, like the lack of ASL interpretation. Attitudinal, such as the many examples of ableism from the poem. And systemic. These are deeply embedded barriers in our systems that most of us do not question or know about. For example, disabled people must live in deep poverty to qualify for any kind of government support. Their earnings are capped, and if they go over, the, over that, they lose their services. Let's remember that it was just in 1990 that rights were guaranteed under ADA. This is very recent history and happened late compared to civil rights legislation. However, even with the progress of the last 31 years of ADA and, and the Higher Education Opportunity Act of 2008, students still face many barriers to access in higher education, often invisible and attitudinal ones. The structure of higher education is by its very nature ableist and was created with the non-disabled student in mind. Low expectations for students with an intellectual disability have paved instead a well-trodden path from secondary education to day programs and stereotypical jobs. This attitudinal barrier becomes even more daunting because students with intellectual disabilities are often not even taken seriously as potential college students. The groundbreaking Individuals with Disabilities Act, IDEA, is also a significant moment in history to give access to education for students with disabilities. But it is also significant because it defines disability very differently than it had been defined in the past. For the first time, a disability was not defined in a negative way. This was a huge leap away from the eugenics belief. I wanted to highlight the IDEA because this is what we're talking about today. Disability is a natural part of the human experience and in no way diminishes the right of individuals to participate in or contribute to society. Let's watch a short four minute video clip from a film called Intelligent Lives by Dan Habib. Listen to how people communicate about a person's value in this film. Singhi, would you kindly start the video, please? There's no sound. No volume. So usually you can stop share and reshare and make sure you clip those two little boxes. That's usually why. from experience. <laughs> <laughs> One high school in Boston is showing that all students, including those with significant disability, can succeed in general education. Right. Uh, so nine, what? Square. Good, write that in that first box. I don't know what Naya's IQ is. What I do know is that Naya is a committed, hardworking student who has some challenges. How many do you have in the square? Naya, after you paint, you're going to paint one, two, three, right? Cover something up. And then what are you going to do? You're going to step back behind this line here, right? He's going to take the picture. What are you going to paint that makes you happy? What are you going to tell me? Show me. And Nair has a style of his own, and he's not afraid to go in there and freely draw how and express himself and capture line and color and movement. And I don't think he really knows how talented he really is. If I got half of that from some of my other students, I'd be happy because that, that determination he has is something that is just in him. He cannot 
give that up. He has to do it. She, she white. She's white. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is she a human or mermaid or what? Uh, a mermaid. Yeah. You don't know what it's like. He gets frustrated a lot because what he has in his head is hard for it to come out of his mouth. How many men were killed at Gettysburg? So we're looking for a what? Um, it's not like the movies where you get this teacher that comes in, she saves the day and everything's great. It's one day at a time. You guys can use your study guide. I wouldn't even use the notebook. I would literally just use the study guide while we play Jeopardy. Yeah, guys. I think that intelligence looks different for everybody. It's it's clear that he has an intellectual impairment, but I don't. That, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that he can't be intelligent. Please describe why our unit on government is the most important thing you will learn in all of high school and possibly your life. Right here. You have learned about the government because you will use this information for when you vote. That is very true. You will use this information when you vote. I will add that. Three branches of government. The fact that he is a black man and he is tall. Sometimes it is troubling to wonder what is the what might the outside world perceive him as. If he's being loud or jumpy or enthusiastic, somebody might perceive that as being threatening. It's one thing when they're young and they're cute, but eventually they're going to get older. They're going to go through puberty and the outside world is going to see them very differently. I remember them saying something about his IQ level. And I think it was like 80 or 90. Now, who developed that IQ? So we're using a testing rubric based on the 19th century or the early 20th century. And we're using that in 2015, 2020 to define our children, our children's mental capacity. Nah, I can't buy that. As a mother, I'm not going to try to fix him or change him. I accept him for who he is. You look and see what they're good at and you nurture that. But that's just being a parent. He is going to college. It's not a hope. He is going. Thank you. Yeah. Rebecca, I think you're on the next slide. Yes. Hi, Rebecca here again. So unlike Nair's family, many family members, faculty within institutions of higher education, students and educators do not even know that college is an option for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. My heck aims to remind us that it is possible with the right people, the right supports, and the right systems. Remember, there was a time not long ago when powerful people believed women were not smart enough to vote nor attend university. People of color of all genders were also denied higher education because of similar eugenic and ableist arguments about their, dis their abilities and disabilities. So ideas that seem impossible to us now may be impossible only because we have deep-seated ableist ideas about which privileges are okay for some people to access, but not okay for others to access. Access to college or a real post-secondary experience is actually a great way to give people a chance to develop job skills and to build out their social networks. College education provides much more than book knowledge. Opportunities at college can lead to growth and development. Like this picture on the slide that shows justice, anything is possible if we use a justice lens to build these initiatives together. We will need to co-design alongside people with intellectual disabilities who want to continue learning through post-secondary education. Um, now let's hear from a Minnesota State College student, 
and his experience in an inclusive higher education initiative, in this case, Iowa's REACH program. It led uh, this man, Zach, to employment and a degree program in Minneapolis. So, sing, so sing. Little, tell us a little about Iowa, the University of Iowa REACH program. And REACH itself is an acronym that stands for Realizing Educational and Career Hopes. REACH. REACH, yeah. And it was a great program. Um, the first year, because it's a two year program with an optional third, and maybe even fourth now. I'm pretty sure they have a fourth now. Um, I did the first two. In the first year, they'd prepare you. They'd teach you skills and about what you eventually want to do for a job and gather a lot of information. And in the second year, it's sort of a lot of the same, but they give you an internship. They get you an internship at a place where you had told them about what you were passionate about mm -hmm. to really get you experience in that type of field that you want to go into. And mine was childhood education. So I was at an actual school, an elementary school, and I was an assistant PE teacher oh, for a, two times a week, Monday and Wednesday. Yeah. And Friday, I think, Monday. Yeah. And I loved that internship. I did it for two semesters. And then next year, when I applied for the third year, I got a different one, which led me to my current career path. And that was an after-school program. I interned there for a whole year again for two semesters. But at the end of it, I was offered an actual job. The more programs like REACH, which is phenomenal and it's an amazing experience, the better. Because then, then I get every more kids like myself and lower functioning even the opportunity to go to college, to go to a university or wherever. Or inclusion equals better society. Yes. I agree entirely. So as Zach said, more inclusion leads uh, to a better, us, better society. Uh, we'll, we'll stop that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> so more inclusion leads to a better society. Well said, Zach. Um, we are grateful to Zach for sharing his experience with the Student Voices Project at Minneapolis College. Um, just a note about Zach's use of the phrase lower functioning. We often hear this type of exclusionary expression used when talking about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It's just a reminder how pervasive the language is in all our speech. But Zach demonstrates to us that he is aware of everyone's value and that we all are always learning. He demonstrates that his opportunity to attend college a college access program changed his life and career trajectory. He is now seeking a degree in a field he is passionate about. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one last way to better contextualize and understand ableism and to handle the confusion and discomfort around the language we use concerning disability is to look at the most common disability models still used today. The charity pity model and the medical models of disability greatly influenced experiences and interactions with people with disabilities in a negative way. On the contrary, the social and now justice models of disability liberate people with disabilities to be their whole complex selves. These models stop us from the harmful history of seeing people with disabilities as fragmented people who need fixing, changing, or isolating. We will not have time to go deeper into the models today, but we added resources at the end of the slides for your own exploration. And this slide also has a picture of a graphic that is the disability rights movement slogan, nothing about us without us. Sally, can you do the next slide? Yes, Sally here. So what unlearning needs to happen next? You might be asking yourself, how can we unlearn the models we grew up learning? Uh, what if, and these are just what ifs to think about, systems focused on the spirit of ADA versus compliance of it. 
What if students came together as whole people to learn and were perceived as whole people? What if the goal of education is to learn from each other's greatness? What if difference did not mean less than or other? What if we could all learn together without having to change or hide who we are? Inclusive education. Inclusive education, and I'm just gonna be stopped for a second because I noticed that um, someone noted the ASL interpreter is no longer spotlighted and hoping somebody can do that. Yeah, that happens after videos. So you have to re-spotlight. Okay, thank you. Yep. I'm just sure everybody can follow. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it resolved yet? Working on it. Okay, thank you. Should I wait? Yes, please wait till they say. I'll keep my what if questions up so people can just think about them. Thanks. I think only the host can do it. And Karen says that she can see her now. There we go. Great. Ready, I see the okay. Inclusive education. Inclusive education is one way we can unlearn. According to Shelley Moore, a Canadian teacher and researcher who advocates for inclusive education, inclusive education is about providing opportunities with supports for all students to have access to and contribute to an education rich in content and experience with their peers, period. Notice, there is no other. Meaningful or radical inclusion means that all learners are valued and provided a flexible, optimal learning environment, intentionally undoing past harms and providing the right support for college success. We can also, we can also unlearn by becoming champions for inclusion. Champions of inclusion connect with students with disabilities as people who are contributors. Champions of inclusion communicate enthusiasm and act comfortably around people with disabilities. Champions of inclusion challenge teachers and students with disabilities to work their best towards high standards. Champions of inclusion creatively adapt and utilize appropriate strategies and materials to help students with disabilities learn and succeed. And finally, champions of inclusion collaborate and co-create with students and others to maximize students' development. Next slide, Rebecca. Sure, Rebecca here. So what might be your next step or steps? So possibly we have some suggestions you could examine the negative models of disability embedded in your environment and reframe it with a social justice model. You could be curious, interact and get to know more people as whole people with complex intersecting identities. You could use the least dangerous assumption or the most positive assumption about others. You could encourage opportunities for meaningful inclusion co-constructed with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. All right, thank you for joining us today. We have a few more slides here, but I just wanna say I really appreciate everyone participating in the chat activities and sharing your wisdom with us. Um, we hope that you can all, and we can all really start seeing the value of all people's minds and bodies and help us to reject ableism by unlearning what we were taught and taking some of these next steps. Sally? This is Sally. You are welcome to stay with us now until 4.15. We will continue our discussion about authentic inclusion 
or perhaps you want to talk about some of your next steps. Um, just a reminder, the slides and accessible handout and resources will be shared with you and posted on our website in about a week. We are going to post our website in chat for everyone, and we're going to launch a poll because we would really like everybody's feedback about our presentation today. And here is our poll. And um, while you're doing the poll, I don't want to give you too many things to do at once. <laughs> so answer the poll, and then I'll share about our next learning community event. I'm, am I the only one having trouble with the poll? Any advice? I see some people starting. Okay, just might be me. Hey, thanks so much everyone for taking time to give us feedback. Uh, and did we get our website put into chat? Liz, would you be able to put our website in chat? There we go. Thank you. Our next event is Tuesday, April 19th from three to 4.15. The topic is student journeys. This learning community event provides an opportunity to gain insight from the experiences of current college students and graduates. The presenters will be a panel of students and we will prepare questions ahead of time. So we sure hope you can join us next time where we will be learning from students and students will be teachers um, as we work together to um, expand the pathway to college for all students. And in our slides, and this will be sent to you as well, our resources that we talked about during the slide presentation and our contact information uh, if um, you would like to contact us. <laughs>